What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. So the title of today's video might be triggering to some of you, but for a lot of you in our audience, over saving for retirement is an actual issue that we need to address. And how do I know this? Well, I ran a poll last week on our YouTube channel asking how much of your income do you actually save as a percentage? And the results were pretty shocking. The majority of you have at least a 10% savings rate, which is already more than double. It's actually close to triple the personal savings rate in the United States of 3.4% according to the Federal Reserve. So right then and there, I think you should pat yourself on the back because I think that's pretty impressive. But even more interesting to me was that how many of you guys save between 25 to 50%, 50 to 75%, and then you hyper savers at 75%. You guys are just nuts. Now in general, I think saving more money is usually a really good thing. It gives you more of a cushion. You're able to retire faster and it gives you some peace of mind, but some of you might be taking it too far. And that's what I actually want to talk about today. When you take it too far, that it's actually a detriment to your own life satisfaction. That shows me that you might be over saving for a retirement. Starting with sign number one, which is that your saving is actually affecting your friendships and your relationships. So take a look at this chart of the top reasons for divorce in 2024. Arguing is listed as third on this list and then financial problems are fifth. So if you are arguing about money, it's probably not a good recipe. With 37% of people citing money problems as a reason for divorce, we can see that money is often a topic that can cause stress between two people. This is especially because your mindset about money is personal and can differ from your spouses quite a lot. Now, now, what we actually don't know is what percentage of these people are stressed about not having enough money. I'm sure that's actually a large majority of the people that were pulled. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you're too good at saving money, that it's causing you to all of a sudden forego life experiences or perhaps even delay purchases you absolutely need, this could be a problem in your relationship. Oftentimes, the people that are very good at saving are actually very frugal and the habit of frugality is really hard to kick once you start accumulating more and more money. And this habit of frugality might be one that you have with your partner early on in the relationship that is rooted from a good intentioned place. So you might've gotten together when you were both really young, you're both in debt, you maybe don't have a house and you have no retirement savings. Perhaps frugality was your only way to kind of band together and have financial independence and stability. But as decades pass and pass and both of you guys are really disciplined with saving, paying off debt and actually making more money, your financial situation might improve dramatically. At some point you might accumulate so much money that you are more than on track for retirement and it might get to a point where where perhaps your frugality and your scarcity mindset around money becomes too much. One of the spouses might wanna continue accumulating wealth while the other spouse is thinking, well, the frugality was like a means to an end. And now that we are finally at financial independence, why are we still frugal? And if you're really good at saving, this could actually be a problem that you face with your partner. And you actually need to ask yourself how much is enough and when is it enough? Because that's the entire point of this whole thing. We wanna accumulate money so that we can buy some freedom in our lives and be secure. And we don't want our relationships to suffer as a result of our obsession with saving. It's also important to know when to draw the line on scrutinizing purchases. So early on when you aren't making that much money, perhaps it's easy to criticize your partner for buying things like a coffee at a Starbucks or your Netflix subscription. But as your disposable income grows and your savings increases, some of these small purchases aren't even worth your time in terms of arguments or mindshare, which I will get into later in sign number four. The second sign that shows me you might be over saving for retirement is that time is passing you by and the days are blending together because you aren't experiencing anything new. I think it's crucial to find a balance between financial security and also living a fulfilling life. And oftentimes with the mega saver types, they love to stay home because it's the cheapest thing that they can do. They'll resist the temptation to go out for dinner. They might resist the temptation to take a vacation or they don't even wanna to go to an event like a concert on the weekend because it's gonna cost them money. And that's a habit that many of them will have. And often if you're saving too much of your money, you're basically in this cycle of going to work, making that paycheck, and then you spend the rest of your days at home or in a consistent pattern where time just seems to pass you by. I'm sure many of you guys probably experienced this during the pandemic when there was nothing to do and nowhere to go. Time seems to pass you really, really really fast and all the days started to blend together. Because we weren't experiencing anything novel or new, our perception of time was warped. And this is actually a psychological phenomenon that's an actual thing according to Matt Johnson, a PhD and neuroscientist. Quote, novelty is the yardstick by which our brain measures our sense of time. The more novelty we experience, the more we feel that we're taking in and the slower time feels. Time feels slow and dense when say, you're on a vacation in a foreign land and everything we experience feels new. In contrast, that same daily work commute that we've been doing 
doing countless times before feels like it goes by in an instant. I think it's super important that if you are really good at saving money, you should get a gauge on how much you're experiencing life. Ask yourself, am I living a fulfilling life right now? And if the answer is not really, you should be asking yourself why and being kind of introspective about it. Now, everyone is entitled to do whatever they want with their time. And for some people, maybe that is spending it at home. But for most people, I would say that experiences, time with others and novelty will really help contribute to a more fulfilling life. This doesn't mean that you have to go and blow tens of thousands of dollars on a vacation, a new car, or perhaps going to the club. But what I more mean is that you could schedule some time to hit maybe like a road trip, go for a walk with friends, or go to that concert that you've been wanting to go to. The point of saving all this money is to have that freedom to do so, have a fulfilling life, and have financial security. It doesn't have to be an expensive thing. We just want to shift our mindset from always saving and saving and saving to, hey, it's okay to spend some money here and there. The thing we want to avoid is the scarcity mindset where all of a sudden, if our habit is to save and save and save, we might not ever get out of that. My father is actually a victim of this, so this is not a secret. I think he would be happy to tell you that, that he has a hard time spending money. At his age, he doesn't really think that he can change his behavior anymore. And since he grew up in poverty in Asia back during a period of war, as well as unrest in his country, it's just always been ingrained in him that he needs to save every single penny and dollar that he could. And if you have parents or relatives or even friends that have lived through some trauma, especially financially related trauma, it's pretty common to see this type of behavior. The main point here is that at some point, if you're way ahead on your finances, it's okay to shift some of your savings to consumption if it's within reason and your financial goals are still being achieved. The third sign that shows me you're probably saving too much for retirement is that you are exceeding your financial goals by a large amount. That or if you've already hit your financial independence number already. Now, I recognize that this is probably not the majority of people watching. However, a lot of you could find yourself in this position sooner than you think, especially based on the poll of the data of how much we're actually saving. So here on the screen are Fidelity's guidelines on how much you should save based on your age. And you can see here at the age of 30, if you saved 1x your salary for retirement, you are technically on track for retirement. At age 40, if you saved 3x your salary, you're on track for retirement as well. So let's use the age of 40 as an example. If you're making 100K per year, three times that is 300K saved. So I would argue that if you have more than 300K saved, you're already ahead of pace. Now, what would I consider somebody who is saving too much money? I would probably say if you're double these benchmarks that Fidelity is telling you to have, so you're saving, let's say 6X at the age of 40 instead of 3X, then I would argue that you are probably saving too much money. My assumption is that if you're in that position, you're probably naturally really good at saving. You're probably not going to run out of money in your lifetime because you're making so much more money and your habits are so good that you will most likely stay on track or even stay ahead of track, even if somebody tells you to spend more of your money. What I really want you to avoid is that if you are grinding so much on your work that you aren't enjoying your time and your life with your family or your loved ones, that might be a sign that you are saving too much. And one way to figure out if you're ready to transition from saving, saving, saving to start spending a little bit of money is to make sure you know intimately what your financial independence number is. If you haven't watched my video on the 4% rule, you should probably check it out after this video. I'll link it down below. But essentially that video covers how much you can spend in retirement without ever running out of money for an average of 30 years. The general idea is that a 4% withdrawal rate is very safe for the time period of 30 years. That means we can withdraw 4% from our nest egg or our financial independence number every single year without ever running out of money based on the math. So to figure this out for yourself, first we need to take the amount that we need to replace in retirement. So if you want to spend $60,000 a year in retirement, you just divide it by 4% or you can multiply it by 25, either works. So that's about $1.5 million is what we need in this situation. And you can use a calculator online to then figure out how long it'll take you to get there based on your investing return rate, as well as your savings rate and how much you have saved already. So you can see that if we need $1.5 million, I would assume an investment return of 8%. That's the average in the S&P 500. And then the savings rate here is you can play around with this to see how long it would take you to hit that number. You can see that at a 40% savings and investing rate, it will take you about 12.7 years to hit $1.5 million. If you already have 250K saved for retirement and you're earning 100 K per year. Of course, if you are trying to hit financial independence and retire as early as possible, then you might want to adjust that accordingly. But in general, I want to show you guys the four step process for how retiring early works. So step number one, you want to figure out your expenses yearly, looking at every single category that you spend money on. And then number two, you want to multiply that by 25 to get your financial independence number using the 4% rule. Step number three is to look at your current savings and how your trajectory is shaping up in terms of your savings. And then step number four is to simply adjust based based on the above three steps. For example, if you're at step three and you're currently trending way above your financial independence number for your age, you can always adjust that financial independence number to be higher so that you can spend more in retirement. Or maybe that just means you can spend a little bit more money now to improve
improve your quality of life in the meantime. Sign number four, which shows me that you are oversaving for retirement is that you are spending too much time doing low impact activities. This could mean that you drive 20 minutes out of the way just to save a few cents per gallon on gas, or you know, you might spend like an entire month growing your own microgreens to save a few dollars on your food bill. Basically at any point, if you are spending so much of your free time to save an inconsequential amount of money, that might be a sign that you are saving too much money. Because that shows me that you don't understand the opportunity cost of your time and that perhaps you're being too frugal. Ali Abdal recently made a video about buying back your time in a time management video that I found so fascinating about the opportunity cost of time. In his video, he talks about the concept of the buyback rate, which is actually talked about by the author, Dan Martell, and that is defined as the following. Basically, you wanna take your total annual income and you wanna divide that by 2000, that gets you your hourly rate. And then if you divide that by four, you get your buyback rate per hour. So let me explain here. Let's say you make $100,000 per year. If you divide that by 2000, that equals $50 per hour. And that's how much your time is worth. Now this buyback rate thing is more for entrepreneurs, but the principle still applies, which is that if you divide your hourly rate by four, in our case, 50 divided by four is $12.5. Anything that you can delegate that costs you less than $12.5 per hour should be delegated because that means you'll get a four times ROI on that spend. In other words, your opportunity cost of your time is worth $12.5 per hour. So if you're spending one hour to drive out of your way to save $5 on gas, it's generally not worth it and you're spending too much of your time doing so. If you're making say 250K per year, your buyback rate is now calculated as 250K divided by 2000. So that means your time is worth 125 an hour. Divide that by four, which is 3125. So anything that costs you less than around $31 per hour, that is technically the opportunity cost of your time where it becomes not worth it to you to do. Of course, there are going to be exceptions like if you enjoy the said activity or you aren't doing anything else productive with your time, but still this is a really good benchmark to kind of look at and gauge, okay, is this said activity that's going to save me money still worth it or not? Sign number five that you are saving too much money for retirement is that you are sacrificing too much of your health as well as your needs for saving. And this is a common problem with hyper accumulators of wealth. They might put off certain things that they actually need in order to save money, especially in America where healthcare is expensive, even with health insurance, I might add, some people are going to want to avoid the doctor or perhaps put off a health related problem because they fear how expensive it's gonna be. It's even common for people who need ambulances in the United States to actually turn them down because they're worried about the financial repercussions of taking one. The average cost of being picked up in an ambulance is anywhere from 400 to $1,200. And even with insurance, your out of pocket costs could still be in the hundreds or thousands of dollars. So sometimes for the purpose of saving money, people are really irrational here and they avoid the doctor altogether. And this is not a good sign, especially if you have the financial means to do so, because I shouldn't have to tell you, but your health is number one. Because if you aren't healthy, you can't actually enjoy the money that you're saving. So when it comes to your health, don't cheap out. The second thing that people sacrifice are things that they actually need. If you are delaying purchases because you think you don't need it, then think again, because this is especially true when it comes to expenses surrounding your safety. For example, you could delay replacing your brakes in your car because you think that they can last a little bit longer, or perhaps you're not getting fire insurance even though you live in California because you think it'll never happen to you. If you find yourself thinking these sort of things, it's time to reassess where you're at, especially if your spending is going towards safety. If it keeps you safe or healthy, that's the moral of this sign. You want to spend the money because it's going to be worth it. All right, guys, did you resonate with this video? Let me know in the comments and make sure to check out another video from me like this one right here on the five signs you're on track to be a multimillionaire. I'll see you guys in that video or a future one on the channel. Thank you again. Peace.